I just love that video. I mean, it, uh, the messages that are, that are there in that. I mean, worries are lost here. Uh, the past is forgiven. Life has hope and uh, shortfalls don't matter. Um, wounds are healed and, and you are, your family, you're safe, you're loved. Welcome home. Wow. Uh, that's the ideal picture of what it means to go home, isn't it? And I, I saw that video and I thought, you know, that's what all of us are trying to create is that environment uh, for others. Whether we be a couple or a family, we're all trying to create that environment when people are around us, that they feel safe, that they feel comfortable, that they feel like their shortfalls don't matter, like they're accepted. And, and that's where we're going, isn't it? Isn't that really... I just thought that just kind of encapsulated so much. I remember going home when I, uh, on Thanksgiving after I had gone to college. And, you know, my story is that I'd gone away to high schools, uh, to, to out of uh, town to high school. And I, after high school was over, I stayed in St. Louis and didn't go back to the farm. And so I hadn't been home a lot, and that was by my design. And my parents were, you know, really kind of, I know, grieving them. I see that now. I think if my kid did that, I would kill him, you know. Or, or, but, but they put up with that. So I went home for Thanksgiving. And, you know, you go to your old room, and your old room's just the same way. Mom and Dad had enough sense not to turn it into a yoga room or a workout room or something, you know. They left everything the same. And it's just your bed, and it's your furniture. And, you know, things had changed through the years just a little bit, but it was a little boy's room was what it was. I had a few rock posters on the wall, you know, and stuff like that that Mom would let me have. But, but still, everything in the room was was like it was when I was a little boy. Some of those things were still there, you know, over on the shelves, some, you know, some model cars that I had made when I was about 12 or 13 years old. You know, guys used to put together these plastic cars and, and 4-H uh, uh, ribbons and, and junk like that. And it was like, wow, this is me. This is my own little world right here in this room. And, and here I was, you know, a long-haired hippie, but I was back at home and it just felt so safe and just, you know, there's no place like that. There's no place like going home. And, and uh, mom would cook the food that I liked, which was, you know, as you've heard before, terrible. She, she really couldn't cook, but we, we, you know, she could cook cherry pies. Man, cherry pies were great. And you'd go home <laughs> and I would always get a cherry pie every time I went home. You could count on it at some time, because I love cherry pie, and she cooked a great cherry pie. And the reason she cooked me cherry pies wasn't because I was such a great son or I had done anything that was so fantastic, but she cooked me cherry pies because I was her son. Just that. That gave me privilege because she just wanted to bless me. She just, you know, extend her grace to me. That's, that's what it means to go home. Robert Frost said in uh, his work, The Death of the Hired Man, have you heard this before? He said, home is where you have to go there and they have to take you in. You know, you got to go home sometime and they have to take you in no matter what you've done. And not everyone has this experience, you know, not everyone has this wonderful experience of having a home to go to. And I, I know that home could be a place where you don't want to return because there's some bad stuff there. And maybe the image of father, as we start to talk about this today, you're not even wanting to listen to this because the image of father, you know, brings back some things that you really maybe don't want to hear. You'd like to forget. Maybe, maybe father to you means judgment or punishment, or maybe father to you means, you know, a lot of other wild stuff. But, you know, one of the problems today that we're facing in our culture, and just to be kind of general here, is about 40% of our families don't have any kind of a father that's, that's involved at all, you know, and it's really leaving a gap, especially in the development of our young men as to who they are to become. And then worse than that is some of the ones that have a father that's involved and it's an extremely negative thing in their lives. And if that's your experience today, I encourage you not to turn this off, okay? Don't go someplace else because you need this, I think, more than those who grew up with a wonderful father. Because you see, the love of God of a father is stronger than any pain that any human being can inflict upon you. Do you believe that? Do you believe the love of God, the power of God Almighty, is stronger than any wound that you can have? 
And so you see, we got to go down this trail. We got to go down this road, even if it's been a bad one, and, and let God begin to, to work in that. Uh, we have uh, accounts in the, read the accounts in the Bible of the families. And, you know, if you, you really are honest there, you see these families in the Bible. And they're not models for how to do family. They're not models at all about how to live. They're, they're all dysfunctional. All the biblical families are dysfunctional. It's just kind of weird when you start to look at them, you know. Like you'll, you'll hear people say, well, you need to have a biblical family. Listen, a biblical family is one that's very flawed. If, if you look at the whole picture, I mean, brothers kill each other. Uh, parents take sides with twins, you know, play them against each other. Uh, parents, um, you know, a husband goes down to Egypt and tells Pharaoh down there that his wife is actually his sister because she's so beautiful. And then later on, his grandson does exactly the same thing. And I mean, the stories also are all kind of R-rated. The, the, the biblical families are kind of saucy, as we would say. You know, uh, a daughter-in-law uh, dresses in disguise in order to seduce her father-in-law so she can have children. Wow, you know. Uh, the daughters get the dad drunk because they're afraid that they're he might die and they're going to not have any children. I mean, this stuff, we wouldn't even make this up today. I mean, it's just really wild families. And there's not one family from cover to cover that we would look at and say, okay, you should be like that. Do exactly what that father and what that mother did. You know, none of us want our families to be like that. That and the reason that they're there is because they're like us. They're like our families. And they tell the entire story because it's a story of God's grace and a very fallen world. This is how the families are presented. The, the writers don't gloss over things to present them as being perfect. They present them as being real. And, and God carries his story through them. And I mean, they can sell their brothers as a slave down in Egypt and yet... Yet God still preserves them and blesses them because he's made a covenant with them and they're his and, and he was theirs. And from the human side of this, the human, human side of the covenant, it was the father who was the head of the family. It was their link with God. It was always the father. I mean, we wonder sometimes if you've ever been asked, you know, would you read uh, this passage of Scripture for us in the Bible study? And you start to look down, it's, it's a genealogy, and you go, oh, my gosh, it's Gilmash and Shemash and Hemash and Shemash. And it's like, how did in the world these names, why do they put all this stuff in the Bible? Why do they put these genealogies in there? Because that's their link in the covenant, because that shows their connection with God. And it was all through the family, and it was through the fathers most of the time. And they knew who their household was, they knew who their clan was, they knew who their tribe was, and the greatest important to, to them was the covenant promises came through their family line. And we don't think that way. We don't think, well, I know that I'm going to be blessed by God because of my father. See, things have changed. But for them, for us to understand what father meant then, this was their connection with God. And this is how they got their blessings. And we also see instances where people really mess up bad and, you know, they deserve judgment. And God says, well, more or less, this is a Don paraphrase, but he says more or less, well, because of who your dad is, see, I'm going to let you off because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's that covenant that comes to them. And the covenant meant that they would receive God's grace, God's unmerited favor, simply because of the family. I mean, we, it isn't that way anymore. But that's the way it was for them. And the father was on the top of that. Their families were flawed, but the family was the link to God. And the role of the father was different in their ancient world, so much different than it is for us. Today, to say that it was a man's world back then is an understatement. The ancient world of the Bible was a patriarchal world where the men owned the property, where the men made all the decisions, pretty much all the decisions. Very few women had any power. That wasn't anything that was unusual just for the Hebrews. The whole world was like that. But we look back on it in our eyes and we you know, have trouble accepting that and we want to judge that. But the father was the head of the household. That's the way it was. And the household was their lifeline. And to be without family 
meant that you were complete with, completely without security because the family was the social security of their day. No government cared anything. If you wanted protection, you needed a community. You needed a family. If you wanted financial stability, you needed a family. As you aged and you were no longer able to take care of yourself, it would be your family that took care of you. Nobody else was going to do it. So you depended completely on your family. And if the father were to send you out, were to kick you out of the family, which was very, very seldom ever done, you know, it just wasn't done, it meant that you were destitute, that you, that you were doomed because you were without anyone because the family was everything. And the father had the responsibility. The father who was wise would bring a blessing to the family. The father that wasn't so wise would not bring a blessing to the family. And so it's just extremely important. In fact, it was so important that it made the Ten Commandments. You know, Deuteronomy 5.16 says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you. And then it tells you why. That the days, your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has given you. Maintain this, this relationship, this system, this family system, and it will go well with you. And if you don't maintain it, you're going to be alone, is what God's saying. The entire social economic system rested on the father's faith, on his intelligence, on his character, on his courage. And we can look at that and we say, well, that's just not right. You know, that's just not politically correct at all. You know, we can look back on that and say, what about the woman? You know, and uh, they deserve equal pay and they deserve equal standing too. And, and we, can, we can complain about this all that we want, but to understand what that meant in that day to say father is where we need to go. And father in the ancient world meant leader, it meant security, it meant protector, it meant provider. And your connection with the past, your connection with the future, your connection with God. That's what father meant. So in their day to call God father meant so much more than what it does today. You see, there are a lot of titles and names for God. Uh, each of them kind of describes some attribute of his nature, his character. We can call him Lord God Almighty, okay? And he's, you know, how powerful he is, Lord above all. We can call him Creator and, and note that he created everything. We can call him Savior and note that he has paid the price for our sins. But of all the names and all the titles of God in the Bible, the title of Father is so close to us, so intimate to us, because it, it shows us relationship. And we know what it is to be in family, good or bad. We know what it is to be in a household um, and to go home. And I think that saying that we are children of God and that God is our Father is the most intimate, is the most powerful picture that we can have. Nothing else, okay, can take that place if we don't have this. If we're missing this part, of who God is towards us as Father. Nothing else can fill that void. And I'm not really sure that we can receive that welcome home where we just rest and really feel like we're part of the family unless we get the Father image. So it's only natural that God called himself a Father. And he does so first as the Father of the nation of Israel. When he sent Moses to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let the people go, he said, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn, Exodus 4.22. That's how what Moses tells Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And God repeats that many times, establishing the relationship of the father with the children, the people of the nation of Israel. And God was their protector. He was their provider. He was their teacher. He was their leader. God was their father. So he speaks through the prophets too. Through, through first Jeremiah and, and also through Hosea. And he says, I am your father, call me father. This is early on in the story. And then we have Psalm 103, 13, that just spells this out so well. It says, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. God says, if you wanna know what I'm like, okay, I'm like a father in the way that I love you. That's what I'm like, you see. I may be God Almighty, I may be God Creator, I may be God the Savior, 
but in the way that I love you, I'm like a father. And although we have no perfect pictures of father in the entire Bible, God establishes himself as father. And he says, call me father. He says, Noah's flawed, Abraham's flawed, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, they're all flawed, but I'm not. You see, look to me as a father. And, he, and here's the implication for those of us that are fathers as well. If you want to be a good father, if you want to be a great father, if you want your flaws to be covered by my grace, then let me be your father. Learn what it means to be a good son, is what he tells us. Now, it's really sad today that I think the image of father has fallen on some hard times, even in the church. Um, years ago, radical feminism, for all the good that it did, kind of destroyed this. You know, they, they, they missed completely the meaning of God, what God was saying. For he was not saying, oh, men are better than women. That wasn't what he was saying at all. God, God was the one that invented equality. And next week we'll talk about that when we talk about women in relation to God. But um, just because... We call God Father doesn't mean we think God's a man or male, obviously. I mean, come on, give us a break. What is meant that God is using their culture and how things were in their family system of that day to say, um, I'm taking care of you. I've still got your room ready for you. All right, it's just the same way as when you left it. You can come home anytime you want. Everything's good here. I'm waiting for you to come home. And we need to grasp that family relationship that God has established for us. Now, Jesus uh, went much further in establishing uh, for us the household relationship that we have with God. Uh, when he spoke to God, he called him Father. Jesus did. And in his recorded prayers, he always said, Father is how he addressed him. Uh, there in John 17, 1, he looked his eyes to heaven and said, Father. Um, when he tried to explain who he was and who God was, he said, had you known the Father, you would know me. If you know me, you would know the Father. The two are one. The Son isn't subordinate to the Father. They are the same. We're the same entity. He said, but if we are, you know, he's Father, I'm Son, trying to use these family relationships to explain to them the intimacy, the trust, that they had between each other. If we know Jesus, we know the Father. It's, it's family, it's home, it's blood. We're safe. And when he was asked by the disciples, remember, uh, how to pray, because evidently he prayed a little different than what other people prayed, and they said, teach us how to pray. Remember how he started off? He said, our Father. He didn't say my Father. He said, our Father, okay? He's saying, I want you to have a heavenly Father too. That's what he was telling them. He's not just my father, guys. He's our father, see? He's not just a father because I'm his son. He's our father because you're sons and daughters too. You may be the son, the daughter of Jacob or of Obed or a son of Boaz or whatever and so forth. But, but more than all of those fathers, you have a heavenly father. He is our father. It's his house in which you're safe, in which you're accepted. It's his family, you're forgiven, and you can rest. And then on the night when he was arrested, there he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and all the sins of the world were falling upon Jesus, and it says he's in deep anguish. And for the first time, Jesus is experiencing what it's like to feel sin in his life. And he actually starts sweating blood, and he's in such anguish. And he prays at that time, and do you know what he prays? He goes, Abba. Now, Abba is an Aramaic word, which was the language that most of them spoke at that time. And Abba in Aramaic means Papa or Daddy. And so here he is at the most difficult time anyone could ever imagine. And he doesn't pray God Almighty or Lord or anything. He goes, Daddy, Papa. You know, I don't want to go through this. If there's any other way is what he prays. Have you ever prayed Papa? Have you ever prayed Daddy? Have you ever begun a prayer with Daddy? 
Jesus teaches us how things really are. Um, Years later, the the Apostle Paul would use the same language of Abba, uh, first to the Galatians in Galatians 4, 6, and then in Romans. um, I want to read this Romans passage for you. It's Romans 8, 15 to 17. You're familiar with this. I know we've used this before. But Paul says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba. Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Paul says, God's chosen you as His children. You're adopted. Uh, You you didn't just happen, you know. It it wasn't a mistake, it was planned. This is planned parenthood from the from the very beginning of time. He chose you as children, and, and God is Papa, God is Daddy. The Holy Spirit reveals that to you. He lets you know in your heart that my relationship with God is not just one of fear, but it's one of intimacy and one of family with you. You don't need to do anything to win Him over. It's been vested to you just the way that you are. Now, for most of us, we have some work to do here, I think. I, I don't know, you know how long you've been a Christian, but there's always some work to do in this, I think. Um, human fathers are imperfect and flawed, and sometimes they do and they say some things that, whether intentionally or unintentionally, can hurt and can heal. And it's probable for many people that the image of God as Father has, let's just say, some baggage that comes with it. When you hear the name Father, there may be some stuff that's there for you. Remember the scene out of Forrest Gump and Forrest and Jenny, Jenny had come home and, and Forrest and Jenny were just taking these long walks and they stumble upon the house where Jenny was raised in. And Jenny stands out in front of the house and she stands there for a long time and Forrest has some distance from her and then she starts picking up rocks and she just throws rock after rock at this old house. And you could tell that, man, some bad things went on inside that house. And finally, she's just exhausted, and she, and she falls down on the ground. And Forrest, you know, is, is the narrator of this. And he says, sometimes I guess there just aren't enough rocks. You know, we don't get to choose that. So you don't get to choose your parents. You don't get to choose what happens to you. You just you know, have to walk through it and let God's love and his grace heal that. People have told me that they can never pray the word, the name Father because of what their father did. And I understand that. I really do. Uh, we, none of us have perfect fathers. But I want to encourage you to press on. If that's you today, if there's just one here today, I want to encourage you to press on to do some hard work for unless we accept this, this intimate relationship that God the Father wants to develop with us, we will always be limited in our ability to receive His grace and also to give His grace to others as fathers. So let me end today. I, I want to tell a familiar story that actually Trevor uh, started us off with on the prodigal. And it's, uh, it's in the Bible, so it's one of the, you know, the prodigal son. It's, it's there in Luke uh, 15, beginning with verse 11. You all know the story so well. It's a, it's a parable that Jesus tells. And it has uh, some varied meaning, but, but the core of it, it also reveals to us um, who the Father is. And, of course, in the story, you know, it's the second son, and he's, he's going to get half as much in, in their culture as what the first son gets for inheritance. But he asks for his inheritance early, which is a huge insult to the Father. It's to say, I wish you were dead. Okay, just give me the money now. And he takes it and he runs off and he goes clubbing for a long time, you know, and he spends it on wine and women and he's just, just having the time of his life. And to leave the family, remember, to leave your family, leave, leave your father is to say, I don't want you, Dad. I don't want your God. I'm out of the covenant. I'm breaking out. I'm going to go do my own thing, you know. And it's just totally an anti-faith thing completely. So, you know, he lives it up for a while, and then you know how the story goes. He finds himself, the money runs out, and he finds himself so destitute that he's feeding pigs. 
And of course, feeding pigs to the Jewish culture is just the bottom of society because pork is forbidden, of course. So it shows how far from God he's, he's gone to be feeding these pigs. And there he is, and it says that he comes to his senses, and he, he's dirty, and he's got pig manure all over him, and he's hungry, and he thinks back, and he remembers that even his father's servants are living better than what he's living. And so he launches his plan that he's going to go home, and he's going to just beg his father for forgiveness and, and ask his father if he can just work on his farm. He doesn't want to be a son, doesn't even dare think that far. And you know how the story goes as he heads home and he's on his way and there he is walking up the path and he's, he's hungry and he's, he's stinking and like I said, he's got pig manure all over him. And it says the father sees him from a long ways off. The father's watching. And the father runs to him and he gives him this big bear hug and kisses him. And it, the boy starts his speech. Father, I'm, you know, and the father, he's not going to have any of it. He's not going to have his son working for him. But what does he do? He calls for a servant and they bring out the royal robe. And he puts the royal robe on him and he puts a ring on his finger, the signet ring of the family. He's back in the family. He's never left the family. And he gives him sandals for his bare feet. And then he says, let's have a party. And they're just going to celebrate because my son who was lost is found. And God says with that parable, that's what I'm like. That's what I want to be for all of you. I want to be that father. This week is in your prayers just just make it a habit of starting that prayer off think of God the Father as the father in the prodigal son story where he's waiting for you a long ways off and he's got the robe for you, he's got the ring for you he's got the sandals for you he wants to give you the hug okay think think of God the Father like that okay next week we're going to look at uh, how God uh, uses women uh, to build the household of faith and uh, 
It's a great story there. Let's let's have a, a prayer to close this up and seal this up, and then we'll we'll close worship. As deep cries out.